Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a few moments. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by AJC. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's new digital platform that will enable you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. We are delighted to be joined today by David Horovitz, founding editor of the Times of Israel, for discussion on the new Israeli government. AJC is proud to partner with the Times of Israel on our joint weekly podcast, People of the Pod. To listen to this week's episode, please visit ajc.org slash people of the pod. Our moderator for today's discussion is Jason Isaacson, AJC Chief Policy and Political Affairs Officer. After we hear from David and Jason, we will take your questions. You may email your questions to questions at ajc.org, questions is plural, or use the Q&A chat feature in Zoom. Jason, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for joining us uh, for today's uh, webinar with David Horowitz. David, thanks for spending the time uh, with AJC today. Um, as Bell said, uh, we want to speak about the new Israeli government, uh, the direction it's going, um, how we got to where we are today. But because it's so much in the news these days, I think we should begin with a, just a brief uh, couple of questions about the coronavirus and how it has affected Israel. Um, and I know that earlier today, uh, there was an announcement that the Israeli health minister will be stepping down, um, which is surprising because Israel has been I think quite well known for the way it has responded to the coronavirus, uh, to the extent that even other governments are consulting with Israel. We saw a tweet from the, Israel, from the Austrian uh, chancellor just a few days ago about consulting Israel on how Israel has responded. In light of all of that, why is it that the health minister is, uh, is stepping aside? Okay, so um, first of all, hi, and um, thank you for inviting me to do this, and uh, I hope it's nice and clear and, and uh, audible and What's visible. It? I'm in my home in Jerusalem. Sunday is a work day, but I, you know, I, I go back home after the, the day's work. Um, Israel's done, you know, by, by the conventional barometers, I guess, spectacularly well, not okay, incredibly well. Um, the death rate in is the death toll in Israel is 200. Uh, we had our 200th fatality uh, today. Israel's a population, we just had new statistics today, but it's, uh, it's less than 10 million. Uh, Belgium, which has a population of about 11 million, has about 7,000 dead. Uh, Britain, which has 55 million, I mean, the numbers are staggering, 20,000. So Israel um, has handled this very well, closed its borders pretty early, uh, not without um, issues. Uh, communications in, in parts of the ultra-Orthodox community were not good, and therefore it took time to bring things under greater control there. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet, but certainly I think Israelis feel, in terms of the, the first imperative, which is keeping people alive, we've done really well. Um, there's a balance. Uh, uh, you look at a country like Sweden, uh, they chose to find a different balance uh, quite hard-headedly. Um, I think they must have assumed that there would be a higher death toll, but that they would do themselves less damage economically. And now that Israel is, is starting to relax a little bit, you are hearing uh, criticism that they've been too tough uh, on the economy, that things have been too, too uh, restrictive. Uh, most shops are open as of today, or could have been, uh, big chains didn't open because they feel that they are owed compensation. Uh, a lot of your, uh, a lot of people on this call will know Machane Yehuda. Machane Yehuda is not really supposed to be open. There was a bit of a, um, you know, a, a demonstration that, that got a little bit nasty today uh, because of a sense of injustice. So big picture, really, really well. Some economic concerns and a feeling that maybe uh, uh, things could have been smarter on the economic front, none of which explains the, the, the final question that you asked about Yaakov Litzman deciding that he's not going to be health minister anymore. Now, he's, he was a very well-liked health minister, I would say, until fairly recently. Then he, then he got into a lot of controversy about uh, an alleged pedophile uh, wanted in Australia, who Israel has uh, um, uh, made very difficult to extradite her. Um, and that sort of uh, stained his image a little bit. And then it was alleged that, that he contracted the virus. COVID-19, 
um, he did contract the virus. The allegation was that he contracted it by defying his own ministry's regulations and actually being part of a, of a prayer group of uh, a tfilot when he shouldn't have been. Now, he denies this, and it's not been uh, established one way or another. What we understand is that he, the spiritual leader of the Gur Hasidic sect to which he belongs has kind of said to him, maybe you want to, you know, uh, move to something uh, where it is, it is possible things might be controversial and or it's possible you could do more good. So he's let it be known he doesn't want to be health minister anymore. After basically a decade on and off, he'd like to be the housing minister. Um, so that's what you heard. Uh, I don't know that he's going to be the housing minister. Uh, it does seem that he's not going to be the health minister. Thank you, David. Um, let's talk about another aspect of the coronavirus and how Israel has responded, and that's the interaction between, really the cooperation between uh, Arabs and Israelis uh, within Israel, um, Jewish and, 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 and Muslim doctors and other medical personnel working together side by side in Israeli hospitals. Uh, there's a front page story about that in today's Washington Post. Um, it's been much talked about. Also, in a conversation that AJC had, a, a webinar that we hosted on Friday with Nikki Mladenov, the UN um, a coordinator of the Middle East peace process, um, he spoke about uh, Israel's help uh, with the Palestinians in the West Bank, but also in Gaza. Talk a little bit about that aspect, the Israeli-Arab um, interaction and cooperation in confronting the coronavirus. And, and by the way, what it might augur for the future. Okay. Um... Look, the story that uh, the Washington Post did for, for Israelis, and I hope for people who've taken an interest in Israel over the years, it's wonderful to see it being highlighted. Uh, the fact that it is regarded as, uh, wow, who knew, is a little, a little depressing. You know, this yeah. is a country in which a quarter of the country is, is, uh, is defined as Arab and other, 21% Arab and other, 5% other, 74% Jews. Um, there are a few areas that are more overtly a function of banal and wonderful cooperation, if you like, between Jews and Arabs, than the health service, than the hospitals, the nurses, the doctors, for goodness sake. You know, this, this, this is obvious to all of us in Israel. And, you know, I have to say, it's great if the Washington Post is telling people who, who didn't know about it uh, um, that, that's what, that that's how things are, that we do actually get along quite well within Israel. But yeah, we do. And the health, the health system in Israel um, uh, functions only uh, because of, of cooperation and uh, resources and skill sets from across the, the population. Now, the health service, by the way, one of the reasons why, why we were so draconian was because, like health services in, mo in much of the world, it's underfunded, it's under perennial strain, and there was a huge concern that we would have you know, a mass of, in of infection and, and huge requirements for ventilators and so on. Um, we, haven't, we haven't got to that. At the moment, there are 100 Israelis on ventilators. The number's hardly ever been much higher than that. It went to 130, 140. Uh, the concern is that it gets to you know thousands. Uh, the eased regulations are going to be retightened uh, if we go above 300 people on ventilators. We're told, and we probably have now three or four thousand ventilators. So the service itself, I'm not saying is, you know, flush with money. Quite the reverse. But the personnel and the interaction between the personnel between Jews and Arabs is you know something uh, extraordinary and 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 the norm, both extraordinary and the norm. In terms of of fighting contagion within Israel. Um, I, I mentioned before that the, in the ultra-Orthodox sector, I would say communication was really poor to that sector. I personally think that Litzman should carry, uh, should have done a lot better. I mean, that's his, his public, and he, I, I don't think most of them were not pig-headed or extreme. Most of them were not aware of what was going on for too long because communication was poor. Once the message got home, the ultra-Orthodox sector on the whole has been spectacularly um, smart and cooperative. B'nai Brak, which was the epicenter, the army went in in a very constructive way and says that, you know, the way they've interacted with the mayor and the, and the city has been amazing. In the Arab sector, I'm not sure the communications were too good either. Um, but the incidents, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, oh my goodness, are things going to get bad in the Arab, in the Arab uh, uh, towns and villages? They haven't, relatively speaking. There have been areas with quite high incidents uh, in, in the Galilee, for example, uh, there have been situations where towns and villages locked themselves down because they didn't want uh, a further spread in the Arab sector. Uh, they've been smart. They're, they're mayors. All through, all, in all of modern Israeli history, you sometimes have quite extreme politicians in the Knesset. The local council leaders in the Arab sector, in my experience, have always been extremely savvy, extremely concerned for the well-being of their residents. And that's the way you saw it play out and you've seen it playing out. 
there have been cases there are uh, that they are relatively high on the on the register proportionately of uh, infection and like i say the local leaders in those areas have been you know ahead of the authorities at the national level in some cases in doing everything that they can to thwart a spread in terms of relationship relations with the palestinians uh, in the west bank there was good cooperation i think there still is good cooperation uh, there's been and this is really interesting because it, it reflects the wider norms for better and for worse practical day-to-day -day cooperation as there is in the security field pretty good in the medical field um, good interaction between the re relevant people people on the israeli side who have to deal with the tachlis with the with the concrete stuff yeah things have been good and we've worked well and so on but in social media and in, and in material that is sent uh, among from including from the sort of hierarchy of the palestinian authority a measure of incitement against israel allegations that israel in some cases, even allegations that we've deliberately spread the virus, which is ridiculous, of course, but allegations which are not without a, a kernel of truth that a lot of the infection among Palestinians has come from Palestinians who are working in, in Israel. As far as we understand, that may have been the case, but it's been distorted and misrepresented and used to incite against Israel in some cases. In terms of Gaza, I don't know that the, the Mladenov, who you had on a, on a call like this a few days ago, will know more than, than I know, I suspect. But, you know, there, I, I, I'm pretty sure there's been some maybe indirect communication about how to handle this. Gaza has been relatively low in terms of incidents. The first cases that we heard of were people who had come in from places like Pakistan. They'd been elsewhere in the world. They'd crossed into Gaza from the Egyptian side. Uh, Hamas, as far as we can tell, has been quite effective in isolating people and quarantining people, has made threats against Israel. If we don't have enough equipment, we're gonna blame you. If we have an outbreak here, we're gonna blame you. But we've also heard, you know, and it's been kind of semi-confirmed that maybe there's more dialogue now between Israel and Hamas and talk of some possibility of Israeli fatalities, their bodies being returned in return for information. And I don't know what, I don't wanna to be too specific about that because it's not clear to me what's going on. In terms of how this plays out, uh, I'd love to tell you that, wow, this is going to harb harbinger a new era of cooperation uh, between Israel and Gaza. I don't see it for a second. Uh, between Israel and the West Bank, I don't see it for a second. Um, uh, you know, where human life is at stake with the PA, uh, there seems to be cooperation. Where human life is at stake with Hamas, as has always been the case, I suspect it will be how can we exploit this to our advantage and no remote chance of any uh, genuine improvement of relations. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that for a second. But in terms of national unity within Israel, uh, this, this has really been a, you know, an example of um, the country and it, to a great degree working together to fight a common enemy, so it seems. Yeah, look, I, I don't wanna be too depressing, um, which is my norm, um, and we have cooperated. Um, in, in terms of the ultra-Orthodox, uh, I don't think we're out of the woods yet in in terms of, of the actual uh, contagion itself, I think nuance has, tr has triumphed in that relationship. In other words, there was a lot of blame the ultra-Orthodox a few weeks ago, and now I think people, are, people, people who want to be sensible realize that it's not so straightforward. And by the way, things are you know, very practical. So you've got known carriers in, in neighborhoods in Jerusalem and, and parts of Nebrak. Well, why aren't those people coming out and going into quarantine hotels well, maybe it's because both parents have got the virus and they've got 12 kids and who's going to look after their kids? Yeah. And, you know, maybe their kids aren't going to get the virus, it would seem now and so on. So there's, I think Israelis generally are more aware of the nuance. And, and there I think, you know, I don't think it's going to do harm to, to it, the internal uh, cohesion. In the Arab sector of Israel, um, in terms of, of life outside the healthcare service, I don't think things are gonna change in any serious way, but maybe it's been a reminder for all Israelis as well that we're kind of all, all in this together and, and the way the health service uh, has functioned, maybe that's a sort of uh, um, an added element of, of, in, of internal unity and cohesion. Let's hope so. Yeah, well, thank you. It's certainly been the message that's been sent to the world. Um, Let's talk politics, um, David, which is why we originally invited you on this to this conversation. Um, so last Monday, uh, I think it was Monday night, uh, the Prime Minister and, uh, and Benny Gantz, the leader of Blue and White, uh, signed an agreement. Um, uh, Prime Minister will serve for 18 months as Prime Minister, then, uh, then Benny Gantz will take over theoretically after 18 months. Um, 
where are we in that process? The government is not yet in place, correct? Uh, what are the steps that need to be taken? Also, there's going to be a huge cabinet. Can you talk about all that uh, when, when, when the, the final ink is dry on this agreement? Yeah, I think people, you know, I think we're so um, weary of not having a fully functioning government that when they signed this deal last Monday night, some people might have been forgiven for thinking, oh, we have a government now. No, we don't have a government now. We have an agreement signed by two people. Uh, I'm not even sure. I mean, he's, uh, Netanyahu has signed coalition agreements with other uh, parties, including Yaakov Litzman's United Torah Judaism, for example. But we don't have a government. It hasn't been sworn in. Um, they were talking about trying to get it sworn in ahead of Independence Day or uh, um, the day before Independence Day is, is Memorial Day for, um, for Israeli um, soldiers and, and fatalities and terrorism and so on. You know, is it possible that they'll, they'll get the, this sworn in tomorrow or Tuesday? I tend to think not. So I suspect we won't have a government, um, maybe not this week at all. Meantime, you have the Israeli High Court, which has been asked to intervene um, in about half a dozen petitions against aspects of this agreement and Netanyahu's capacity to serve as prime minister or to set up a new government, given that he's been indicted in three corruption cases. Uh, it's not at all clear what the court will decide to do. Um, the court tends not to intervene when it comes to political agreements. So in my utterly non-expert and don't take my word for it assessment, um, I think some of the aspects of the deal itself, I'm not sure that the court will intervene. I don't know what to make of the likelihood of the court intervening on petitions about Netanyahu's uh, legality to serve. An Israeli Knesset member or an Israeli minister um, who's been, uh, an Israeli minister, let me, let me uh, rephrase that, an Israeli minister who's been indicted um, has to step down. Uh, there's this uh, lacuna that says a prime minister doesn't. Um, or again, more accurately, there's a lacuna that we've never, we've never had a, a legal test of whether a prime minister has to step down. Ehud Olmert, who wound up going to jail, resigned before he'd even been indicted. So none of this has been tested yet. We don't know what the court will decide. There's some really staggering stuff in, in the deal. Um, essentially, I, I, you know, I, I encourage people on this call to go read a piece written by a colleague of mine named Chaviv Retig Gur, um, which includes the word monstrous in the headline, um, uh, calls the deal monstrous. It's a quote from Eliakim Rubinstein, who was the former deputy president of the Supreme Court. There are aspects of this coalition deal that essentially neuter the Knesset. You cannot pass legislation for six months unless both Gantz and Netanyahu are supporting it. Um, essentially, the, the, all the provisions that are designed to protect Netanyahu, should the High Court uh, uh, try to intervene, um, to some extent um, affect uh, basic laws of Israel, our quasi-constitutional laws, and they affect the functioning of the Knesset. So I don't know how the court's going to deal with this. Um, they've given the sides, I think, until today to respond to some of these petitions. Uh, they're going to have to deal with this fairly rapidly. Um, so that, you know, potentially could yet interrupt the process on the way to a deal, or it could affect the way the deal plays out. Explicit in the agreement is that if the court intervenes in the first six months, the deal is off and we have new elections. Um, so we, we may, after essentially 16 months since the Knesset dissolved in December 2018 for the April 2019 elections, we may be just days away from a fully functioning Knesset, you know, for the first time in 16 months, or there may be another few twists. Likud sources are saying that if the court intervenes in any way, there'll be new elections. Analysts are saying that Netanyahu kind of expects that this isn't going to work and wants new elections because he's riding relatively high in the polls because of the way he's handled the virus, whereas Gantz has betrayed his public by agreeing to sit with Netanyahu when he promised that he wouldn't. So I'm not sure that we're out of the um, political woods yet. Um, remarkable. Uh, thank you, David. <laughs> um, well, actually, let's talk about the fact that it has been so long since um, there has been a, a, a permanent government in place, uh, which one could say after three elections is a sign of dysfunction in Israeli democracy, or one could say, on the other hand, it's actually a sign of Israeli resilience, that uh, it has... The government has maintained the security of the state. Uh, it's handled the response to the coronavirus uh, effectively. Um, life goes on. Um, what does this say about, what, is, what, is, this, what is, is the current process telling us about Israeli democracy? Yeah, I, I'm not sure there's a definitive answer to that. And I think people's take on it 
you know, depends on, on many um, aspects of their assessments and, and maybe most of all their assessment of Netanyahu. You know, we've had, we've had a prime minister now in power uh, consecutively for longer than anybody else. This is the longest consecutive term and cumulatively he's been in power longer than any prime minister in our history, having outstripped uh, David Ben-Gurion almost a year ago. Um, if you love Netanyahu, you, you think uh, it's just astonishing. This guy who's, um, who's been ganged up on uh, by the media, by the opposition, by the cops and by the state prosecutors who've trumped up these ridiculous charges against him. And he nearly, he was nearly finished in three elections, but here he is <laughs> back again, about to head a government for 18 months. And then he's supposed to rotate the prime ministership. Yeah, we'll see if that happens. He's basically back. And if you loathe Netanyahu, you, you have the opposite take on, on most of those things. This, this divisive politician, um, head and shoulders above his rivals as a politician, which is not necessarily a compliment, has somehow managed to manipulate the public, um, get the courts to postpone his trial, uh, somehow it forced Gantz, although I don't know quite how you explain that, into a capitulation, uh, as, uh, into becoming the junior partner with a destroyed uh, opposition alliance uh, in your looming new government. Um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's any way you take it. Um, you, you could say that the fact that for 16 months we've had a transition government and yet we function pretty effectively, what a, what a glass half full for Israeli democracy. You could say how increasingly worrying that the prime minister has alleged that law enforcement is ganging up to oust him, how ridiculous, and how much faith are you destroying in the, you know, the other hierarchies of our democracy. Um, no definitive answer. Um, some, of, some people on this call might judge just from the way I described it, uh, where I stand on this, but it's not so simple. I have, I have a huge amount of respect for Netanyahu for having kept Israel safe from in, in very, very difficult periods in the last few years. I think his, um, the, the, the rapidity with which he internalized the potential threat of the virus is to be praised. I think he, he uh, uh, at the time, and, and especially in retrospect, I'm not sure that he didn't overhype the danger, but he's kept people alive to a radically successful degree by comparison with almost everywhere else on earth. And that, these are things that stand immensely to his credit. He is extremely smart. He's very worldly. He's very effective on the big macro issues. He's very articulate. On the other hand, I do, I do share the concerns about the battering at some, of, at some of the hierarchies of our democracy, most especially concerns about uh, um, the, the assault on the state prosecution and, and the cops for investigating him and really invite his invitation to Israelis to take sides with him against law enforcement. And he is divisive internally, notably against uh, Israel's Arab minorities. And therefore it's a very, very complicated reality. Uh, what's been playing out in the last few weeks is it, it is pretty astounding that the, the man who led the opposition and who almost ousted him three times and who had a mandate from the president to form the next government. Gantz was recommended by 61 of 120 Knesset members. He decided, you know what, I'll join Netanyahu, having promised the opposite. Um, and there are people who say what a noble thing he did. And he, he placed his, his personal career above politics. And he's not certain that Netanyahu will go ahead with the rotation but he thinks Israel needed a stable government and it couldn't carry on like this. And then there are people like me, by the way, who say, okay, so support the government from opposition for six months and don't push us to new elections. I agree, back the government in the handling of the coronavirus crisis, but don't uh, enab enable them to carry out some of the policies that you strongly oppose. And one last thing, that, and then I'll shut up on this long answer because I didn't answer at the tail end of your last question. One of the criticisms of, of this process now is as you said, you know, this, this vast government that's supposedly going to take power with 32 rising to 36 ministers, you know, extra costs of hundreds of millions of, of shekels at a time when, when the Israeli economy is, you know, is, is, is in meltdown, 25% unemployment when we had less than 4% just, just a few weeks ago. So it's a very, very mixed take. Um, there's, there's, you know, our democracy is certainly holding up, um, uh, but it's, uh, it is at the same time, it is also, I would say, um, being, being battered. David, uh, let's talk for about a bit about the policy uh, pillars of this agreement between Netanyahu and Gantz, and in, in particular the annexation question, uh, which has gotten a tremendous amount of, of attention, as you know, around the world, as well as in Israel. Um, 
talk about that a little bit and the degree to which um, there is agreement to annex or maybe more precisely apply Israeli law to um, areas uh, that have been administered by Israel. Um, how extensive is that, uh, is that territory under, in question? Um, what are the conditions under which annexation or whatever we wish to call it would go forward? Um, is there actually some understanding that there will be consultation with neighbors and with the international community and with the United States government? Where does that stand? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And the first thing to stress is that in this agreement, which essentially outlaws almost any legislation in the first, first six months, um, the only exception is annexation. Um, the agreement um, that uh, on this question, without question, Netanyahu imposed on Gantz was that uh, from July the 1st, the prime minister is um, within the framework of this, of this deal allowed to advance progress on, on annexation, either to get it approved in, in the cabinet uh, among ministers, in other words, or in the Knesset. I'm not sure he'd have a majority among ministers. He might, um, but he almost certainly would have a majority in the Knesset to advance extending Israeli sovereignty, annexation. There are minor differences, but they're not significant, bringing under Israeli law um, parts of the West Bank. So he can move ahead with that. Um, that is a major concession by Gantz. If you like, the second major concession, the second uh, major reversal, his first one being, of course, that he was not going to sit with Netanyahu so long as Netanyahu was under indictment. The second one uh, being that Gantz had made clear he opposed unilateral annexation. Um, he, he, was, he thought he regarded the Trump plan as, uh, as a potential uh, positive or even as a positive, but he, he wanted to advance it, he said, uh, in coordination with other affected players uh, in addition to the United States. So Jordan Valley, well, we'll have to deal with Jordan on this and the Palestinians. The settlements, well, we'll have to deal with the Palestinians on this, as well as, he didn't specify, other international players. Uh, Netanyahu's approach is in coordination with the United States, absolutely, but in coordination with the Palestinians or the Jordanians, not explicitly, maybe with the Jordanians, uh, maybe not overtly, because he wouldn't, he wouldn't want to lose the peace treaty, but he, he ostensibly wants to go ahead with this. As long as the Americans are okay, he's planning to do this, he says. Uh, are the Americans okay? Well, there's some mixed signals on that. From the very first day, from the day that the Trump uh, framework of, um, uh, you know, uh, th this vision of peace to prosperity, um, it was not clear from the way Trump himself spelled it out, um, whether the plan meant that Israel could collect, if you like, on its dividends from the deal right away, or whether it required negotiation with the Palestinians, Netanyahu thought he could go ahead and start annexing from the get-go. Uh, the impression created by some American officials was indeed to that effect. And then Jared Kushner and others clarified, no, we don't want you to move ahead with this until you have a functioning government. And it will be on the basis of uh, us, uh, with you, defining the areas that we're talking about. So if we are to have a fully functioning government, and if and when the Americans, in coordination with Israel, define the areas, then Netanyahu ostensibly wants to move ahead. And the impression created is that it would be to extend sovereignty to all of the settlements in the West Bank, which is not a huge proportion of territory. It's only a very, very few percentages of territory. Um, and potentially um, up to about 30% of the West Bank, including the Jordan Valley. So that's a much greater territorial chunk. Netanyahu again today said he intends to move ahead with annexation, believes it will, still, it will soon be possible. Uh, I don't think we know specifically what he has in mind. And at the moment, I mean, as of now, there's no green light from the United States because we don't have the functioning government and they haven't finished the mapping. But the impression has been that the administration will be supportive. Mike Pompeo said last week, basically it's up to them, um, them being the Israelis. Uh, I think still with the caveats of, uh, of, of a functioning government and the mapping being uh, completed. You pointed out the Jordan Valley issue. Um, in addition to annexation, are there other questions that will, that a new Israeli government constructed the way the agreement seems to have suggested last Monday night, that that new Israeli government will have a different attitude, a different approach to bilateral relations with Egypt, with Jordan, and relations with the Arab world, those countries in the Arab world that have begun to have quiet, for the most part, contact with Israel. Do you see a new Israeli government with Prime Minister Netanyahu in the lead, but with Gantz and Ashkenazi and the other parts of this new coalition 
having a different approach or being seen differently in the region? I don't think so, because I think the, the injection, if you like, of, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's very hard to define blue and white. Um, blue and white is, is a much smaller alliance now because it's Yesha Tid and Telem elements, Yair Lapid and Moshe Alon's elements are no longer part of it. Uh, but at any time, it was very hard to define on the political spectrum. The, 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 the unifying factor of blue and white, the only unifying factor of blue and white, was the commitment to work to oust Netanyahu. Well, that's no longer what they stand for. So I don't know where to put them on the spectrum. Um, and then when you think of what this coalition is, is committed to, fighting the, the virus and annexation. Now, the virus is, is not uh, uh, um, going to rebrand the, the Israeli government in terms of the, where, where it sits on the spectrum of relations on the big geopolitical issues. Um, and annexation, if anything, renders the, the new government more hawkish than its predecessor. It may have sounded hawkish, but it didn't annex. Well, the new one says it's gonna annex. Does that mean things are gonna go uh, pear-shaped for Israel in its relations with the Arab world? Not clear to me either, because there are other forces at play, as you, as you kind of hint at there. For all that Israel has ostensibly been led by a very right-wing coalition, its relations with parts of the Arab world have improved. Um, you know, the relationship with the Saudis, some of the Gulf states, I mean, the Times of Israel interviews the Bahrain foreign minister. That didn't used to happen. Uh, Saudi generals come and stay in the King David Hotel and, and tweet out pictures uh, of them meeting with Knesset members and, and Palestinian politicians. Uh, all of that, or, or much of that, stems from a shared concern about Iran and the sense that in Israel there is a government that is determined to prevent Iran from achieving a nuclear capability. So I think you're going to have the same balancing of interests in the Arab world with potentially impacted by the fact that we might have a government here that actually does annex. And then the question is, does that deter a more public warming of relations with some relatively moderate Arab states, or does it make those relationships more complicated? You know, how does it affect the relationship with Jordan? And then add into the mix, as we always must, Netanyahu has talked about annexing and he's promising to annex but he hasn't promised yet to carry out the promise. He hasn't done the annexing. So, you know, these are things that will become clear in the next, next weeks and, and not very many weeks of that. Um, I think, as you know, AJC has been very active in that space for, uh, for a, couple of a couple of decades now. Uh, and uh, this will continue to be uh, very high on our agenda, the relationship between Israel and the Arab world. Um, I think at this point, uh, David, I'd like to ask uh, Bell uh, to, uh, to call in other questions that have, uh, that have come in from those who are watching this, uh, this, this conversation. Bell? Thank you, Jason, and thank you, David. We actually have a very huge audience, so I'm going to try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, David, from your perspective, how much is the U.S. election on the mind of Israeli leaders and Israeli public at this time? Do we think that a Trump victory would be welcomed by the Israeli public in the same way that a Biden victory would? Okay, so there's two parts to that question. Well, actually, there's four if I want to be really pedantic about this. Um, and I'll, I'll just try and, and give some sense. The Israeli public, are they focused on the American elections? I don't think hugely. Um, the, the Israeli, Israeli leadership, it may be. Um, maybe if we, if we believe that Netanyahu really wants to go ahead with annexation, which he might, and I just can't give you a definitive sense on that, um, it might be that he's looking and thinking, well, I can't be sure that we'll still have Donald Trump in the White House much longer, and therefore, if I want to move on this, I better do it now, given that it's likely that a Biden presidency would be less um, empathetic on the annexation front. Um, then the second part of the question about how Israelis might feel it, it, you know, I cannot give you a categorical sort of consensual answer. It's so complicated, the, the Israeli take on Trump. Um, I, you know, I, I always go back to the, to the time before the last elections when, when Israelis were polled about who we would want to win the American elections, right? And every poll that I saw, Israelis would have voted Hillary Clinton by 10 and 20%. And in some of the polls, people, are, people were asked, and who do you think would be better for Israel? And in all those polls, Israelis said Trump. I mean, that's just incomprehensible, right? So if we'd had the vote in your elections, which we don't, we would have chosen for president the candidate who we thought would be less good for us than the one who we weren't going to vote for, right? And, and how do you explain that apparent contradiction? Uh, you know, I think, I think Israelis look um, to American presidents that they think, do they, do they get what we're going through? And I think Israelis feel that they felt with Clinton and, and Trump, 
they both pretty, pretty well get it. And I think they would feel the same with Biden and Trump. And, um, you know, are they, are they emotionally uh, empathetic to Israel? I think they would feel the answer to both of those, to, to that question would be yes for both Trump and Biden as it would have been with, with Trump and Clinton. And then maybe the third and last element, are they dependably in our corner? And I think the reason why uh, in the last election campaign, Israelis thought Trump would be better, but might have voted for Clinton anyway, was because they didn't know enough about Trump and the track record and so on. And nowadays, I think, you know, enough time has passed. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of Israelis who have lots of reservations uh, uh, about Donald Trump in much the same way that the American electorate is very divided and, and has a uh, mixed take. I think Israelis on the whole, though, would feel that Trump has, you know, come through when Israel's needed them with uh, the possible exception of um, uh, the issue of, of American troops in Syria and a concern, it's not a small concern, about an America with a leadership that is, that is tending to the isolationist. Um, you know, I think that's a factor here. Um, the, the, empathy th the empathy thing, I think, is a big deal. It explains why um, Obama was most popular in Israel straight after his visit to Israel. So these are factors. I think if, if Biden can convey a sense of empathy, that would uh, raise the support that he has in Israel. But it's not hugely on the Israeli public mind. Where it's on, on the mind, I think, is in, in, in the, uh, the mindset of the leadership. And where it's being borne out in, in policy by leadership, I would say, is on the issue of annexation. And then the big strategic issues of how engaged in this region is the United States? How engaged is it likely to be? Does that mean that Russia um, is more dominant? Are we troubled by that? You know, those are factors that are certainly in the mind of the Israeli leadership. And also the question about how the next administration will handle the issue of Iran, which very much is on the mind of Israeli uh, policy. Yeah, planning. look, for sure. But, but I think ultimately, Jason, on Iran, look, it, it obviously, whatever, we, whatever has to be done or whatever isn't done, um, the, the nature of the discussion between Israel and the United States has been astoundingly intimate. Um, yes you know, the exchanges of visits when it was, was more, more, more feasible in the pre-corona era, but the sharing of information, you know, that, but, but ultimately, of course, if Israel feels that it needs to act because nobody else is acting and the threat has reached a level, um, you know, we, we, can, we can assume that Israel would do so. And then, by the way, you know, we can talk about this forever. Uh, bringing uh, someone like Gabi Ashkenazi into the Israeli government there, you know, I don't know what kind of a factor that is. If we believe everything that we are told, uh, Gabi Ashkenazi was one of the breaks on Netanyahu taking action against Iran. I'm not entirely sure that Netanyahu was about to act, but Ashkenazi was in the mix of security chiefs who told the prime minister that the Israeli option, such as it was, uh, was was probably a pretty complicated one. So all of those things feed into the mix. Ashkenazi is now to be our foreign minister if this deal goes yeah. ahead. Uh, Bill. Thank you. We've had several follow-up questions on your comments on annexation, including from AJC Honorary President John Shapiro and many others. In your opinion, and perhaps in the opinion of the Israeli public, does annexation mean the explicit end to the possibility of a two-state solution? Yeah, I, I hate those short questions because they require an immediate answer. I, I prefer the longer um, ones, but no, it's a really good question. Look, this is one person on, on this uh, conversation. So my take on this is not definitive. Um, it, it's very complicated as a consequence of, of the way the American plan has been presented and some of the um, aspects of that plan that, that have not been clarified, possibly uh, intentionally so. Um, if, and, and then it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, of your take on this, right? It's anyone's take on this. Uh, if Israel annexes all the settlements, does that put an end to the two-state solution? Uh, I'm not sure. If Israel annexes all the settlements um, minus or, or, you know, the, 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 the additional element of 15 of the settlements, which in the American plan are, are designated something like enclaves or communities within, I don't remember the, the wording that they use, you can look it up. They're in, a, in part of the, of the West Bank entity that is earmarked for a Palestinian entity. So there is supposed to be some kind of arrangements put in place that enable Israel to maintain effective security and ultimately, if, if they're to be annexed, to, to, to bring under Israeli law, under Israeli sovereignty, 15 settlements 
inside an intended Palestinian area. I don't know how that works, and I don't know how that complicates a two-state solution. You know, at what point, is there a point at which the lack of potential contiguity of whatever is left in the, the, the West Bank, is there a point at which the, the absence of, 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 of viability means that really there's no two-state solution? I mean, obviously there is a point. Do we reach it uh, the day that Israel annexes all the settlements? Um, you know, I, I, I don't think anyone can give you a conclusive answer. There are people who would say, and I'm agonizing in this answer because I think it's so important. There are people who would say it's too late already. There are people who would rejoice that it's too late already. Already, Zionists, Israeli patriots who think the two-state solution is over, v'tov shekach, and, and good that it is so. And there are people who think, for, for heaven's sake, one hopes that it is not over for Israel's patriotic Zionist essential foundational interests. Um, and therefore, I don't want to give you a definitive answer. I write about this often. I've written about it. So if you want a nuanced, well-thought answer, by all means, read, read things that I've written. Um, I, I certainly think that the, the one element that I've tried to highlight in this answer of those 15 enclaves is, is a great complication for, for those of us like myself who think that a, two, that a viable two-state solution, a secure two-state solution, a two-state solution that does not threaten Israel's demographic and security interests, I think that, that that should be a goal for us. So for people like me who think under those parameters, it should be a goal, that aspect of the Trump Accord, those 15 enclaves, is a particular complicating factor as far as I can see. If I may just jump in, uh, David, is that the goal of the prime minister and is that the goal of Benny Gantz? You mean to end the possibility of a two-state solution? Of, of, of viable, yeah, I don't, I don't, viable, secure two-state solution. Yeah, I, 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 I'm certain that Gantz would, uh, if, you, if you said to him, is that your goal? He would say no. Um, and I think Netanyahu would say no as well. I think Netanyahu would, would say, um, the problematics of a two-state solution is the rigidity of, of the definition of statehood. And he would argue, you know, if, if a state for the Palestinians is an entity that cannot threaten us militarily or demographically, you will find me ready to partner the Palestinians toward that kind of state. But he would, he would add the caveat that the definitions internationally accepted, he would say, are such that no, I cannot in the foreseeable future partner the Palestinians to statehood on that basis. And therefore, you asked a very simple, clear-cut question. There's, there isn't a simple, clear-cut answer. Yeah. And, um, Bill, another question, perhaps. I'm going to give you a couple of questions on the parties in Israel themselves. Stephanie in Mexico City is asking, they're, given the ever-shifting party dynamics in Israel, what do you see as the future of the left wing and the Labour Party in particular? And who do you see emerging as leaders of the opposition? And then Tamar in London is asking, can you comment on the joint Arab list? They seem to have made substantial gains in the last election, but has their power increased at all? Okay, your questions are great. Uh, let me take the second one first. So the Arab list um, grew to 15 in the last elections, um, from 13, the one before, and 10, the one before that, if memory serves. And the 10 was when they ran on two lists, and the 13 and the 15 was when the joint list was, uh, was uh, resurrected. So you have to say in terms of political strength, they got stronger. Uh, you have to say that they reversed a process which seemed to be the um, um, alienation, if you like, from Israeli politics of the Arab sector, um, which I think was being encouraged by the prime minister. Again, this is my take. I think Netanyahu wanted to um, uh, discourage um, the Arab turnout because it, it would have meant, of course, a greater proportion of, of votes um, for his part of the spectrum. And he succeeded to some extent uh, three elections ago in April, uh, less so in September and much less so uh, in our last elections in March. Um, Gantz then um, really rejected the joint list as potential partners as Netanyahu essentially had done um, and therefore alienated part of the Israeli Arab leadership in the process who had recommended him as prime minister. Uh, so I'm not sure um, there, there, there is less overt a difference between some of the stances that Gantz took and, and Netanyahu took than some people would wish to acknowledge. 
um, it's striking that the one, as far as, I, as far as I remember, the one member of Gantz's part of Blue and White who hasn't gone with him into this imminent alliance with Netanyahu is the Druze uh, member of Knesset. She has stayed out of his um, uh, shift towards Netanyahu. I think that's pretty interesting. In terms of the, the Zionist left, uh, you mentioned the Labour Party. Um, we should talk about Yesh Atid, which is Lapid's party, which has certainly got some left-wing elements as well as some centrist elements in it. Uh, there's merits in that mix. Well, they're in a pretty shocking state. Um, Labour is basically voting today. Um, I'm not even sure if the, the, the results were not out when we started this call. They might be out by the end of it. I think the polls close at eight. Less than 4,000 members of the Labour Party, which is a staggering figure in and of itself, were, were voting on whether to let their leader and one of their two other Knesset members joined the coalition with Netanyahu. Amir Peretz shaved off his moustache, some of you may recall a few months ago, as proof that he was not gonna join Netanyahu. That was his proof. You know, I'm shaving off my moustache uh, while he's joining Netanyahu, if his party will let him. Merav Michaeli, the third Knesset member, said, I'm not joining up. And she's put it to the Central Committee that they shouldn't be allowed to join up. We'll see what the vote is. Whatever the vote is, the Labour Party that led Israel for the first three decades of statehood is reduced to three members uh, who are arguing among themselves about joining a Netanyahu government. Um, and if we had elections tomorrow, would be eclipsed. Um, I think any reasonable assessment would, would say they would not score more than three and a quarter percent. They would not clear the threshold. Meretz wouldn't partner with them because they've abandoned the partnership by joining Netanyahu. So you have to say the Labour Party, which has been you know, written off many times, as has Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu seems to be doing just fine. I think the Labour Party is really enjoying, that's the wrong word, but it's, it's taking its final breaths, it would seem. Uh, Merits might get a little bit stronger as the party that uh, did not um, uh, move over to Netanyahu. And Yesh Atid will try to resurrect itself as the party that was a, a, a credible opposition to Netanyahu before, became a viable opposition under Gantz and nearly ousted Netanyahu has now lost Gantz to Netanyahu and will try to rebuild. But the state of the center-left Israeli opposition to the right in Israel um, is, is dire and it will take a long time to recover. Bill, next question. Thank you. David, Ben in New York is asking, from your perspective, you've covered a lot of issues that are obviously in the news on about this election. What is the most underreported important story to emerge from this new government that the listeners on this call don't know about and should be aware of? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that because um, probably if it's been underreported, it's because we didn't realize that, that it was important. Um, I have to tell you that reading, you know, my Hebrew is pretty good and I've lived here for 30 years. Uh, it's not perfect and it's certainly not legally, I'm no legal expert. Um, but on the night when that coalition deal was published, and it was published, 14 pages, I think it's 41 clauses, I, I defy, um, well, I don't need to defy them because Israel's top legal scholars have been agonizing about this agreement for the past week. There are aspects of it that we don't, you can't understand definitively. It's very, very hard to understand them. Uh, there are lots of allegations made. It basically, Netanyahu has a right of veto over the people who are gonna be judging him. I've heard that being alleged. Well, kind of maybe if you want to interpret it creatively, um, there's, a, there's essentially a bar on major appointments to key public sector uh, positions for the next six months. Um, that would include potentially the chief of police, the deputy state attorney general, that's a big deal. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that there are, not, there are not many appointments beyond that. On the other hand, the deal also provides for the emergency nature of the government, which is supposed to be six months, to last longer if they agree. The, 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 I think probably the best answer to your question is what's, what's, what's most underappreciated perhaps, or what's most hard to grapple with is the complexity of this agreement. Uh, an agreement put together by two leaders who mistrust each other um, for very different motives with all kinds of clauses that appear in some cases to contradict each other that are certainly not easy to interpret. I'll just give one more example. The agreement is explicit that if the High Court intervenes in the next six months and says Netanyahu cannot be Prime Minister, we have to hold new elections. 
it is not explicit about what happens if the court were to intervene further on down the road. Uh, it has sections that you might interpret as providing for what might happen. It's not clear. It's not clear if we're going to have 36 ministers. Initially, they're supposed to be 32. Um, Blue and White is saying they won't use all of its ministries. The, agree the agreement provides for a second official residence for the person who's not prime minister of Gantz and Netanyahu when the other one is prime minister. Uh, we're not even sure what we should call that title. We think that we should call it the kind of alternate prime minister. Again, it's not a function of the, of the translation, it's a function of the title. Uh, I could go on and on. There, it is such a, a, a curious agreement, born of mistrust, and, and I, the one last thing, I'm sorry, I keep adding one last thing, the, the neutering of the Knesset is, is really quite a staggering thing. Uh, the the um, accrual, if that's a word, of greater responsibility to the executive at the expense of the legis legislature, with the judicial now being asked to try and sort this out. A weakened uh, judiciary, you might add, that was defied by the Knesset speaker uh, less than a month ago when Yuli Edelstein said, I'm not holding a vote on who's going to be the speaker, just didn't do it, closed down parliament. Uh, so now this, um, this judiciary that's been, been shown contempt by the Knesset is being asked to save the Knesset from itself and say this deal shouldn't be allowed to stand because it neuters the Knesset. So I just think there is so much confusion uh, and so much constructive vagueness reflecting so much mistrust and, and a motive on the one hand by Gantz ostensibly of high principle and Israeli national interest and a motive attributed to Netanyahu of trying to safeguard himself uh, should his legal situation c uh, continue to be uh, uh, problematic. Um, it's, it's given birth to a very, very complicated coalition agreement. David, before uh, I ask Bell to ask what may be the final question, uh, let me just go back a little bit. We've been talking about the outcome of the election and, and the agreement uh, that was signed last, uh, last Monday night. But just briefly, um, aside from whether the prime minister should continue or not in office as a central issue in, the la in, in these elections, what were the other issues that Israelis were grappling with in the three elections? Uh, Israeli religious secular divide, uh, economic issues. Uh, what, what were the other major issues that the Israeli voters were, were, were contemplating. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a lot, a, a, even those issues revolve to a, to a large extent around Netanyahu. Um, it, it's, you know, I don't think you can accuse me of being um, overly uh, generalized in, in this conversation. I've tried to get into nuance, so I, I, don't, uh, I don't mean to overgeneralize, but so much of it revolved around Netanyahu. It, essentially, I would say almost three elections in a row, it was a question of, do you want more of Netanyahu? And, and that question divided, of course, uh, into sub-issues such as, um, on the one hand, this, this extraordinarily impressive, uh, effective prime minister in keeping the country safe. These are huge issues for Israelis. Would a different prime minister have, have had, would more, more, more of our children in the army have been killed in wars and acts of terrorism under a different prime minister? You know, that's a huge election issue. Do we trust, why did Gantz even reach near equal status with, with Netanyahu in, in these elections? Because he was an ex-chief of staff, joined by two other ex-chiefs of staff who weakened Netanyahu's advantage on the security issue. And therefore they were in the game for the first time, really challenging in a way that um, Isaac Herzog, for example, um, was, was never quite able to muster as potent a challenge because they had that additional security credibility. So that was in the mix as well. And then, you know, divisive internally, the future of our democracy, social economic issues. But if you, you know, if you ask me one issue in Israeli elections, you know, a, apart from the personalities, the security issue and, and the, the well-being of our kids is way up there. And in these elections, it, it has become intertwined with Netanyahu. Is Netanyahu best able to keep us safe? Is Gantz credible? Does Israel have a credible alternative? I think those were big factors uh, in the last three elections. Understood. Thank you, David. Uh, Bell, perhaps the final question? Thank you. I'm gonna ask two final questions together. I think they're both very important. We've got a bunch of questions about security threats currently to Israel. David, do you think that either the coronavirus or the formation of this new government has impacted the immediate security threats to Israel, particularly from Hezbollah and the Iranian presence in Syria. And then also you coming from Ray Termini in Dallas, 
you mentioned there's a lot of unknowns about the government, but if you had to predict, do you expect any major changes in either domestic or foreign policy from the new government? Okay, I, I want to take the second one first because I can actually answer it uh, easily. In other words, I can't answer it. My, my predictive skills are um, um, not, they're so poor, it's not worth me trying. I have no idea how things are going to play out. Uh, a lot of people can make predictions um, and maybe they're, they're, they're smarter than I am. Um, I couldn't, you know, we had a, an office pool on how the elections would turn out, three elections in a row, and I'm much more experienced than almost everybody on my, my staff, and I'm older than almost everybody on my staff, and I do worse on, these, on those kind of things than almost every member of my staff. I don't know. I don't know if this government's going to play out and come into being. I don't know if the high court's going to intervene. And to some extent, these things are unknowable, and therefore, even if I was predicting credibly, you know, who can tell? I don't know. The, the security threats question, you know, I don't know how long we're going to be living in a, in a COVID-19 affected era, but I do think that um, the hostility to Israel is undented by it, and our imperative to be aware of the dangers has not been reduced by it. Um, and you see it, you see it playing out. Um, there was a strike in Syria just the other day on a Hezbollah vehicle. Uh, you've read about it on the Times of Israel and elsewhere. Um, there are weapons that are still being transported, I guarantee you. There is a leadership in Iran that remains as determined to see the end of Israel as it was six weeks ago or three months ago. Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure if their capabilities have been affected. You know, that we might see. I don't see clear signs that they have been. But all of those security imperatives are all there. There's no heightened acceptance of Israel in extremist quarters of this part of the world. There's no reduced hostility. Uh, as I said before earlier in the call, even on the, on the virus thing, you've had incitement against Israel from the relative moderates in the Palestinian Authority, even as they cooperate with Israel in fighting the virus. And therefore, I'd love to end this call on that happy note and say, wow, people have realized that we're all in this together. Wow, people have realized that Israel, it's like a beacon of light in terms of, of, as we said earlier in the call, Jewish Arab interaction. Wow, maybe we should be rethinking our take on Israel. If all those Arab doctors and, and nurses are working to save lives with no reference to the religious or ethnic uh, orientation and, and origin of the people we're treating, maybe we shouldn't hate those blooming Israelis so much. Maybe our hostility to Israel has been misplaced. Maybe we should be learning from them. You know, I'd love to end on the note that says, and that's exactly what we see happening now. But we don't see it happening, certainly not in the extreme quarters of this part of the world. You know, my, my upbeat ending is maybe, just maybe, you know, the greater evidence and the widened reporting of some of those core aspects of day-to-day -day Israeli life will somehow begin to resonate in some of the more uh, closed minds in this part of the world and lead to some more refreshingly open thinking. Uh, let's hope that that happens, even as we recognize that it's not happening yet, and therefore we need to keep up our guard. David, I think uh, in light of the time, I think that we've come to the end of our, of our hour. Adele, uh, final thoughts or message? Thank you, David and Jason, for that truly enlightening discussion. I also want to thank our audience for joining us today. As a reminder, to listen to AJC and the Times of Israel joint weekly podcast, People of the Pod, you can go to www.ajc.org slash people of the pod. And to support AJC's vital work around the world, please visit ajc.org slash donate. Please stay safe and healthy. Goodbye. Thank you. Dave, thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.